Welcome to Forrester University's webinar, Strategic Electrification, Satisfy the Demand with VRF Technology. This webinar is free for you, thanks to our sponsor, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US LLC. And our presenters today are James DeBerry, Commercial Marketing Manager, and Sam Beeson, Manager, Efficiency and Utility Programs. I'll be introducing Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US LLC, as well as James and Sam in just a moment. But as we wait for everyone to come online, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. My name is Ryan Graff, and I'm the Product Marketing Manager at Forrester University. I'll be your moderator today behind the scenes, taking your questions for James and Sam throughout the broadcast, so they may address them during our Q&A session at the end. Today's webinar is scheduled for approximately one hour with a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session to follow. Those of you who attend the full length will be able to download a certificate with your PDH CEU credits starting tomorrow. I'll explain the process on how to download your certificate at the end. If you've joined us as a group, please send your completed group sign-in form to learning at forester.net after the webinar. You can download a copy from the handouts area of the GoToWebinar platform. Today's broadcast is interactive and we encourage you to ask questions throughout. You may do so by entering your questions in the question box and clicking send. These will come to me during the presentation and I'll pass them on to James and Sam to address during today's Q&A session. You may also check your audio here. If you do not have audio at any time, please note this in the chat or question boxes and I will help you. There are a few best practices that we recommend for an enjoyable experience. First, we recommend jotting down this website, joinwebinar.com and webinar ID 214-037-235 so that if we lose you, you can get back in quickly. Second, we recommend using a high-speed internet connection with all other windows and programs closed to avoid any audio or visual lag. And finally, we are live tweeting this webinar. You can join the conversation on Twitter by following us at at ForesterU and including hashtag strategic electrification in your tweets. We'll be following your comments and questions during the broadcast as well as after. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's sponsor and speakers. Formed in 2018, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US LLC, METUS, is a leading provider of ductless and VRF systems in the United States and Latin America. A joint venture between Ingersoll Rand PLC and Mitsubishi Electric US Inc., the company provides innovative products systems and solutions capable of cooling and heating any application from a home to a large commercial building. METUS is a leading marketer of comfort solutions and variable refrigerant flow, VRF, cooling and heating technology. Systems sold by the joint venture include a wide variety of technologically advanced products designed to deliver superior efficiency, comfort and control for every home or building type. The family of brands supported by METUS includes Mitsubishi Electric Cooling and Heating Train, Mitsubishi Electric and American Standard, and Mitsubishi Electric. More information is available at metahvac.com. James DeBerry, Commercial Marketing Manager. James develops and executes marketing plans for Mitsubishi Electric's commercial new product launches and existing product maintenance. With extensive corporate marketing experience, James most recently served as Senior Marketing Manager at AT&T Atlanta. He is a graduate of the, United, or, sorry, the University of Georgia with a degree in journalism. Sam Beeson, Manager of Efficiency and Utility Programs, with 40 years of experience working in the commercial refrigeration and HVAC industry, 
Sam has spent the last seven years with Mitsubishi Electric, working to support their rapid growth through his efforts in their strategic accounts and utilities group. He is passionate about personal and business change that supports environmental stewardship. He attended Snow College and Weber State University. On that note, I'll go ahead and hand control over to James to begin today's presentation. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome to the Strategic Electrification and VRF webinar. On behalf of Sam Beeson, I'd like to thank you for the time you've chosen to invest in today's session and believe you'll find the content presented to be quite valuable. We're planning to spend about the next hour discussing strategic electrification and explore some solutions on how VRF or variable refrigerant flow technology can support strategic electrification. Here you'll see the learning objectives of today's webinar. They include understanding more about strategic electrification. We'll talk about the need for decarbonization or reducing carbon emissions. We'll discuss public and private decarbonization initiatives related to the built environment that enable society to enjoy modern comfort and technology in a much more sustainable way. We'll explain how electric powered variable refrigerant flow, or again, VRF HVAC systems, support strategic electrification and address the associated challenges. Sam and I look forward to sharing our thoughts on strategic electrification, along with a look at a couple of successful case studies that involve VRF technology, and we'll share some additional resources for continued learning at the end. We'll also have time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible, so be sure to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function within the presentation software. With that, I'll turn it over to Sam, who'll begin our discussion on strategic electrification. Well, thank you, James, and thanks, Ryan, while I'm getting my slides up here. Um, I plan to uh, address really the first three objectives that James outlined there. Uh, when I think of defining what is strategic, strategic electrification, I kind of put in three steps. Um, the first is what I consider to be a, a top priority, and that's energy efficiency. And I think that needs to remain fundamental as we think about strategic electrification. Um, proof that Energy Star is actually working is that in the face of an ever-expanding market, utility supply is less today than it was a decade ago. Second, uh, we've got a clean the grid, you know, cleaning the grid through the use of clean renewable energy sources like solar, wind, and water to replace fossil fuel-based generation of coal and natural gas is really important. Um, third, converting thermal land use space and water heating from fossil fuel to high efficiency electric in both new construction and existing building stock, all while we're providing value to the end users. Uh, I wanted to take a look at global emissions. Uh, here's a, a chart that kind of identifies that by sector. If you look at uh, the breakdown, buildings account for nearly 40% of annual global, global carbon dioxide emissions. Um, CO2, which absorbs and readmits heat, is necessary greenhouse gas, but um, the amount emitted by fossil fuel burning technologies is raising the Earth's temperature and changing our environment. Additionally, fossil fuels negatively impact air quality with particulates and emissions other than CO2. For example, nitrous oxide or NOx emissions from fuel, uh, fossil fuel combustion contribute to ground level ozone or smog, which increases the likelihood of chronic respiratory diseases such as asthma or emphysema or chronic bronchitis. Um, a non-combustion contributor is methane, um, not that it's not combustible, but um, fugitive emissions come from a lot of sources. 31% uh, of methane emissions result from leaks in the production, storage, and del delivery of natural gas. These leaks have largely gone unreported, so what's the concern with methane? Well, methane absorbs over 80 times more heat than CO2, and it has be de been determined to be a significant tr contributor to the warming of Earth's atmosphere and oceans. So reducing loads, saving energy, and reducing the use of fossil fuel burning equipment in our buildings are major components of eliminating harmful pollution. 
So how is the challenge being addressed? Well, a number of public and private entities have committed to decarbonizing the built environment and constructing more sustainable buildings. Uh, we're seeing a mix of voluntary and compulsory pathways to greater sustainability. On the voluntary side, we're seeing an increased adoption of LEED, uh, passive house programs. We're seeing incentives for reach codes or above code homes and buildings. On the compulsory side, uh, we're seeing legislation that, and policy changes that are driving um, codes and standards, such as uh, an example is the California Energy Efficiency Strategic Plan, which contains a net zero mandate. And beginning in 2020, all new homes in California must be net zero energy. So to achieve this, building envelopes will be improved, more efficient HVAC systems and appliances will be installed, and solar PV will be incorporated. Um, before leaving office, California governors, uh, Governor Brown issued an executive order for economy-wide carbon neutrality by 2045. You know, our first knee-jerk reaction a lot of times is to think is that the majority of that can be accomplished by replacing coal and gas-generated power with renewables, but it's important to note that only 16% of that goal is accomplished through clean power. Transportation and building decarbonization are other main areas of focus. On the supply side, we have a lot of collaboration between energy service providers. Massachusetts is a great example where the utilities participating in the MassSafe Collaborative have announced incentives to assist or encourage and support builders and developers in the construction of multifamily high-rise buildings and satisfy requirements for passive house certification or similar levels of sustainability. This is a chart from the MassSave Collaborative which outlines program incentives that encourage the construction of multifamily high-rise buildings using the passive house methodologies. And why passive house? Well, passive house buildings minimize energy consumption, the increased durability with features including airtight building envelopes, thorough insulation, high performance glazing, and efficient mechanical systems. On the voluntary side, this is a standout voluntary program called the 2030 Challenge. The goal of the 2030 Challenge is to make all new buildings, developments, and major renovations carbon neutral by 2030. As part of the 2030 Challenge, leading architecture, engineering, and construction firms are designing buildings for increased sustainability and, redu and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. The 2030 challenge is now standard practice in most leading AEC firms. And participating firms are reporting progress towards meeting the 2030 challenge through the American Institute of Architects 2030 commitment. Here's a look at a compulsory measure in California. Again, kind of circling back to the California Energy Efficiency Strategic Plan. You'll recall earlier we noted that all new residential construction must be ZE starting in 2020. But also as part of that plan, all new commercial construction must be ZE beginning in 2030. 50% of the existing stock with commercial buildings will be retrofit to ZE by 2030, and 50% of new major renovations of state buildings will be ZE by 2025. Another notable voluntary measure that people around the country are watching pretty uh, avidly is the Sacramento uh, program. SMUD has an efficiency program. It's got a holistic approach to improving building envelopes and operating efficiencies. Um, they're offering up to $3,500 for seeing and insulation, two grand for higher efficiency heating and cooling upgrades, and converting if you're willing to convert from gas to electric, they'll include incentives that um, I think are $3,000 for a heat pump water heater and up to $4,500 for going from a gas furnace to an electric heat pump. And additionally, um, if you're willing to make your home all electric ready, uh, there's an additional bonus of $2,500. And then there's additional money for panel upgrades when that's required and uh, providing circuits for like an EV charger or electric cooktops, uh, ranges and closed dryers can be added for an additional up to $2,500. On the compulsory side, um, you may or may not be familiar with the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. These are cities that have made formal commitments to reduce emissions by 80 to 100% by 2050. And you can see in this list here, um, there's several cities. And in addition to these cities, there's um, hundreds of the observer cities. Uh, New York City, for example, has already achieved 15% reduction since 2005 and in support of this commitment as part of the New York City Carbon Challenge launched in 2017. Many of the city's largest universities, hospitals, hotels, commercial building owners, and residential property management firms 
have committed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 30% over 10 years. Participants account for over 500 million square feet of real estate, which is more than 9% of New York City's building square footage. And early results have been pretty promising. 21 participants have already achieved 30% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And collectively, participants have cut their annual emissions by 580,000 metric tons of carbon, with a collective savings of about $190 million annually in energy costs. New York City has also passed a benchmarking law requiring properties larger than 25,000 square feet to report on annual energy and water use. Local law 97 limits uh, for the metric tons of CO2 produced per square foot according to 10 building categories. And you can see the building code occupancy groups and formulas for emissions intensity in the chart. Then through mandatory data submissions, they make this information available at meter.nyc, where you can see how individual buildings have scored. That's pretty cool, actually. I logged in and looked at the Empire State Building, which has a, a pretty favorable building score. Limits will become increasingly stringent with bumps and requirements in 2024 and 2030. And to help entice improvements, the New York City Council passed complementary Local Law 96, which established the PACE loan program or Property Assessed Clean Energy Loans. If you're not familiar, PACE loans feature low upfront costs, low interest rates, and longer terms for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. And then the loans can be repaid through a building's property tax bill. I think a lot of times when we hear about climate action or decarbonization plans, we think this is happening somewhere else, or we think that it'll take place at some time in the future, but you know, the future really is now. These public and private initiatives demonstrate how things are already in progress. Not only are things in progress, but there are tangible benefits. A study published in September 2015 issue of Journal of Portfolio Management analyzed 10 years of financial performance data for the Bentle Kennedy Office Building Portfolio. That includes 34 million square feet in the United States and 24 million square feet in Canada. And findings suggest that building certified as sustainable outperform less sustainable but otherwise similar buildings. They outperform in rental rates, occupancy levels, tenant satisfaction scores, and the probability of lease renewals. Decision makers, the building owners and facility managers are now demanding energy efficiency to meet increasingly strict codes, keep with operational budgets, and attract and retain tenants who want more sustainable spaces and the benefits of higher performing buildings. They're now demanding better control as a way to improve occupancy, comfort, and efficiency. Over the past several years, environmental organization implementers, utilities, states, and cities have published reports showing how electrification can enable built environments to decarbonize and address climate change. We kind of joked that 2018 was the year of the report. Um, this is a sampling of some of those reports. Uh, one of the things that really stood out though is solutions were presented to address the challenge. Each report identified heat pumps and VRF systems as the future of heating and cooling. Me for the Northwest or the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership is one of six regional energy efficiency organizations, or REOs as we call them, that are funded in part by the DOE to support state and local efficiency policies and programs. Uh, NEAP produced a report entitled Action Plan to Accelerate Strategic Electrification in the Northeast, and it suggests that we can meet carbon reduction goals by making heat pumps the primary means of heating and cooling by the late 2030s. As you can see in the previous slide, NEPA is not alone in this ass assessment. If we look at the numbers, to meet the aggressive goals we've discussed earlier, 50 to, per six, 50 to 60 percent of buildings in New York City will need to adopt highly efficient electric-powered heat pumps along with other strategies such as improved building envelopes, just you know, using New York as one example. So what will drive the adoption and necessary changes? Um, well, certainly policy and legislation. But there's also incentives to help drive transformation. Uh, the Mass CEC VRF heat pump program is one example where a measure helped to enable 110 large commercial buildings to transition from fossil fuel based heating to high efficient VRF heat pumps. Um, and on their website uh, and the blog earlier this year, Peter McPhee, Program Director of Renewable Thermal, noted to hit our greenhouse gas reduction targets, we need to accelerate the rate of adoption of this technology which means putting VRF on the table for every renovation, heating system replacement, 
and new build. Now, I really like this slide from Synapse Energy Economics because it's a great visual of what results we can expect from cleaning the power grid with renewable energy, along with the broad adoption of electric vehicles for transportation and the use of advanced heat pumps for space and water heating. This is kind of that reward chart where you can see what the results will be. And you can kind of see the IPCC benchmarks in there for emissions of 45% below 2010 and 2030, and the greenhouse gas, uh, green, uh, GHG emissions of zero by 2050. Um, the IPCC is the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was established by the UN to help provide policymakers with an objective science-based view of climate change and its likely impacts and potential courses of action. So in my last couple of slides, I wanted to touch on rebates and incentives. Um, utilities are mandated to reinvest ratepayer dollars into efficiency programs, and that will continue. Um, as a matter of fact, traditional rebate programs for energy efficiency continue to grow. Uh, but one of the things that we're seeing is uh, more downstream and midstream program offerings across the country. And the big change that um, is in development right now is, uh, is that of electrification incentives that's that are focused on moving the market from fossil-based fuels for space and water heating to heat pumps and heat pump water heating. Uh, matter of fact, I just received a proposal last week for an electrification program from a large IOU in California uh, that they plan to have in place in early 2020. So incentive money is being offered by traditional utilities as well as um, CCAs, uh, what they're called in California, community choice aggregators, regional energy networks, which is kind of a new term as well, um, cities and counties are um, working on their own initiatives as they plan to implement measures to help achieve their climate objectives. And then I really like this slide as well too. It shows how energy efficiency spending um, by country and in North America will continue to increase. So at the same time as spending increases to generate renewable electricity, the demand side has seen record spending. Energy efficiency spending in North America is predicted to continue to grow significantly over the next decade. And according to Navigant, to nearly $11 billion per year by 2028. Um, regarding ductless and VRF systems, we're seeing a double benefit in this. Um, we're seeing an incredible amount of new heat pump programs that are being created. And we're also seeing an incredible amount of replacement programs. Huge portions of that $11 billion are being taken away from former fossil fuel programs and being reallocated to heat pumps. So now I'm going to hand it back off to James um, so that we can take a closer look at VRF systems and how they work and how this technology can help move strategic electrification forward. Okay, thanks, Sam. I would like to spend some time to talk to everybody today about VRF technology. I'm not sure how many folks uh, on the on the call today are familiar with VRF technology. So at its most basic, let's start with what is VRF technology. Variable refrigerant flow technology was introduced into the United States over 15 years ago, after many decades of prominence throughout the rest of the world. In fact, in some parts of the country, country overseas, for example, accounts for over 80% of the HVAC market. So instead of moving conditioned air through ductwork to the space requiring conditioning, VRF delivers conditioned refrigerant directly to that space, eliminating the requirement for long runs of ductwork, instead by using small diameter piping. This eliminates the inefficiencies that come with moving conditioned air a long distance through ducts and provides a more energy efficient, quiet, and flexible way to condition a space. VRF systems are electric powered and don't require fossil fuel combustion. VRF systems can be applied in two configurations, air source and water source. Air source systems use air as the heat transfer medium expelling rejected heat into the air outside of a building. Water source systems use water as the heat transfer medium, expelling rejected heat into a water source, typically located inside the building. Both configurations, air and water, maximize energy efficiency. Finally, due to the design flexibility of VRF, it can be applied to a variety of building types and applications. Now let's talk about the differences between a heat pump 
and a heat recovery system. At its most basic, a BRF system consists of an outdoor unit, which you see on the left here, and a network of indoor units connected by refrigerant lines and governed by controls and sensors. And you'll see an example of those indoor units on the right side. Outdoor units may be used on their own as a single module, like you see here, or twinned or combined together to increase capacity to achieve the building's conditioning requirements. The indoor units are available in multiple styles, which increases the application flexibility of the technology. These could be ceiling mounted, like you see on the top on this slide, or floor or wall mounted, like you see below. Indoor units can either be ductless, which means the equipment, which we, excuse me, which means the requirement for duct work is eliminated, or ducted, which incorporates short run duct work from the unit into the space requiring conditioning. You can connect up to 50 indoor units per outdoor unit. Uh, I would say that's probably not the typical scenario, but each large outdoor unit does have the capability connect to connect up to 50 indoor units. With heat pumps, indoor units are either in all cooling mode or all heating mode. So this example that you see here shows all the units in cooling mode. Here we show the units in all heating mode because again, you can only heat or cool at one time, not both. A good use of a heat pump might be in situations where you don't have varying thermal needs. One example might be an auditorium. You don't really need to simultaneously heat and cool this single space, so you would opt to either heat or cool the area. For example, if it's warm outside and the auditorium is full, you might need to cool, to cool the entire area. If it's cold outside and only a few people are in the room, you'd need to heat the entire area. On this slide, we'll explore a little bit more about the heat recovery uh, systems. With a heat recovery system, it does allow you to simultaneously heat and cool different zones within a building. So here you can see the outdoor unit, again on the left, connected to a variety of indoor units. But you can also see the depiction of the blue and red lines that some areas are in heating mode and some are utilizing cooling. So how does this work? This is accomplished with the use of the branch circuit or BC controller, which you can see there just to the uh, left, left of center. One way to look at the BC controller is like a quarterback or a decision maker. It uses a liquid gas separator and the BC controller separates the refrigerant so that some areas are cooled and some are heated. So each area or zone has its own indoor unit that provides heating and cooling. And an example of this might be a building with a lot of exposed glass. Uh, for example, when the sun comes up in the morning and it hits one side of the building, that heat generated by the sun against the glass might require some zones on that side of the building getting the sun to be cooled, but on the other side of the building that might still be in shade, it might be necessary to heat those areas. Traditionally, conventional heat pumps didn't perform that well in colder climates, but modern BRF systems are capable of providing consistent comfort even in extreme climates. Systems perform in conditions from minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit up to 115 degrees. We just recently introduced uh, a new product using hyperheating technology, which is an enhanced compressor system that does deliver heat even, even with outdoor temperatures get as low as minus 31. BRF systems make strategic electrification achievable in cold climates. For example, in areas like the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic, where a large percentage of heating is provided by natural gas, propane, or heating oil. VRF systems provide opportunities to save money and reduce CO2 emissions. Let's talk a little bit more about how BRF systems work. Conventional systems use a fixed speed compressor, which cycles the unit on and off whenever the room dips below the desired temperatures. That's depicted by the black dotted line here. This type of system relies on an all or nothing philosophy with the compressor running at either zero or 100%. This can lead to unpleasant temperature swings as the system strains to maintain a, a constant temperature. Inverter compressors, on the other hand, are always running in the background, adjusting the compressor and modulating the speed in real time. 
That's represented by the green line here you see on the slide. By ramping up power to the compressor when needed, an inverter provides a more accurate on-demand approach to temperature control. If your room temperature is already a comfortable 72 degrees, for example, the inverter might slow the compressor's engine to a crawl. If your room is really warm, say 85 degrees, the inverter will push the compressor into high gear, reducing that temperature more quickly. This is another source of energy savings as this eliminates the energy intensive start stop cycle of conventional HVAC systems. Efficient use of electricity makes VRF an ideal mechanical system for applications that use solar, wind, or hydroelectric as a power source. Optimal use of renewable energy sources requires high efficiency in part due to the current limitation of technologies related to collection and storage of energy. With minimal electric waste, the precision of VRF systems promotes a more sustainable built environment that still retains style and comfort. With regards to sustainability and building certifications, the application of VRF within a commercial building can assist an owner in obtaining LEED certification. VRF is a core contributor to the indoor air quality categories, specifically in the energy and atmosphere and indoor environment sections. Sustainability is great for the environment in the long term, but more immediately, it reduces the operating expenses. You will use less energy and spend less money while keeping your occupants comfortable. Now here you see the rating system of the U.S. Green Building Council. As mentioned earlier, VRF is a key contributor in the energy atmosphere and indoor environment categories. Installing an efficient VRF system in this scenario gets you 28 out of the 40 points or basically 70% of the way on getting certified. Sustainability is essential to strategic electrification, but reducing costs for customers and society is also an important component. Burning fossil fuels releases particulates and gas emissions other than carbon dioxide, such as nitrogen oxide. These byproducts reduce air quality and contribute to ground level ozone. Air pollution can make people more susceptible to chronic respiratory diseases such as asthma and bronchitis. HVA systems account for up to 40% of a building's energy costs, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. VRF systems have a smaller footprint than conventional HVAC systems. The systems are more compact and quieter and lighter in weight, requiring less rooftop structural support. This opens up the opportunity for the roof to be repurposed to add additional amenities like a rooftop garden, restaurant, or other available amenities. There are also cost savings associated with lower maintenance costs. VRF systems require limited maintenance, like cleaning, cleaning the coils, and washing or changing the filters. Another way VRF, VRF systems can help reduce costs is with controls and sensors. VRF controls can integrate with the building management system. Facility managers can control components of a VRF system from a computer or smart device. Controls allow for efficient management, reporting, and tighter control of usage and utility costs. Some indoor units incorporate sensors that allow VRF systems to change conditioning and airflow based on the number and location of occupants. In this example, there's an infrared sensor on the indoor unit called the 3D IC sensor, excuse me, the 3D IC sensor that constantly scans the room detecting motion and occupancy. Based on that thermal profile of the room, the system can modify the heating and cooling accordingly. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Sam. We'll talk about how Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC supports strategic electrification. Sam? Thanks, James. Um, Mitsubishi is, uh, you know, if I could tackle something first, it would be our products. Uh, we have a tremendous product offering for nearly 40 years in the U.S. Mitsubishi has been developing and delivering to the market industry-leading, highly efficient electric-powered 
technologies for all building types. And then secondly, um, the people we have behind those products. Uh, we have the best support team in the industry to help the design community apply our products and to meet the needs of the simplest or the most complex and challenging projects. Secondly, I would talk about you know, the way we uh, advocate and uh, provide support to programs. Uh, Metis has dedicated teams working on policy and advocacy efforts with state and city energy and sustainability offices, as well as utility program development and promotion for strategic electrification. Uh, we also support, support the uh, third party implementer community where a lot of the program design and development work is happening and then we connect that market with the program resources. And we're continually developing and refining tools like our energy estimator to help model energy savings. Um, and we provide expertise to support research, uh, lab studies, field studies, work with the utilities, uh, governmental organizations, and NGOs across the country. Um, I was just at uh, PG&E's lab yesterday where we're going to be having some of our equipment tested that will fit well into the uh, strategic plan in California for their electrification efforts. And then uh, finally, just education. Education is again fundamental to um, having a, we can have a high quality product, but if it's not installed properly, then we don't obtain the efficiencies desired. Um, so education for HVAC installers is key to the success of this effort. Um, we've had a long standing commitment to education, our supply chain. Uh, we have eight Metis training centers across the country, including one at our headquarters in Suwannee, Georgia, and they're also dozens of factory authorized training centers uh, at the distributor locations throughout the U.S. We have course offerings that include um, applications, installation best practices, service, controls courses, and additionally we offer industry-leading uh, continuing education credit courses. And outside of helping the building industry recognize the opportunities created by strategic electrification and decarbonization, we support community-based electrification events for consumers um, like the ones I was at in California this past week in Palo Alto and San Jose, where hundreds of community com members came out to learn you know, what they can be doing you know, in their individual homes and in support of the climate objectives in their communities. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to James to talk about some uh, VRF case studies. James, do you maybe have your sound off? I, I apologize. Uh, thank you, Sam. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll now turn our attention to a couple of successful applications where BRF technology has been used to help promote strategic electrification. Uh, the, the first one is a commercial office building and company headquarters for a Midwest utility company. The utility company was working to help the state reduced its reliance on oil and natural gas. It was in a very cold climate with a design temperature of minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but that design temperature only occurred 1% of all hours in the year. The building was a retrofit intended to promote strategic electrification and demonstrate the efficiency of BRF systems. The challenge was solved with a heat recovery system equipped with hyperheating technology and auxiliary heat. The utility company now is an example of a highly efficient, sustainable heating and cooling building in the state. The second case study I'd like to share is the Hollis 
Primary School in Hollis, New Hampshire. The school building is 51,000 square feet, with each classroom being 900 square feet. Uh, Mr. Dick Henry, founding director of DDH Energy Consulting, LLC, worked closely with the Hollis Energy Committee, the school board, and the Hollis School's Thermal Electrical Project to retrofit the brick masonry school building, which was built in 1952. With the school board and community commitment, the objective was to increase comfort and sustainability. The solution was to use solar panels and energy efficient heat pumps with hyperheating technology. To maximize comfort and enable optimum performance of the heat pumps, Henry advised the school to fully insulate the building, including the above grade slab. This included adding triple glazed windows and applying four inches of spray foam insulation. According to Henry, quote, the HVAC load factor for a school lines up very nicely with the delivery and generation pattern of a solar installation and gives real economic benefits with air source heat pumps. Also, the cost of electricity by and large is less volatile than the cost of fossil fuels. If you're a school trying to budget for the next five to 10 years, you'll have a better idea of your likely cost. And if you have any concerns about your carbon footprint, you can check that box off as well, close quotes. So there are just a couple of examples of how BRF technology was used to promote a sustainable environment and strategic electricity. In summary, what are some of the key takeaways that we've learned today? Strategic electrification is key to decarbonization. It enables society to enjoy modern comfort and technologies while reducing both costs and carbon emissions. By addressing consumer costs and greater sustainability, strategic electrification provides practical paths toward decarbonization. The decarbonization challenge is significant, but public and private initiatives demonstrate how progress can be made. Strategic electrification isn't just the future, it's happening now, and we've seen in the cities of the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and in the incentives offered by utilities. As we've discussed, the adoption of electric powered heat pumps and BRF systems facilitates electrification in buildings. Electric powered BRF technology addresses strategic electrification's challenges and supports requirements, including energy efficiency and cost reductions. And lastly, Modern heat pumps and BRF systems can provide heating, heating and cooling in all climates. This includes providing heating even in the colder regions. That concludes the prepared portion of today's webinar. Sam and I enjoyed discussing strategic electrification along with an overview of BRF technology and a couple of successful examples of how BRF can help satisfy the demand for strategic for strategic electrification. We hope you found the information to be valuable and we look forward to answering your questions in just a few minutes. But first I'd like to share, to highlight just a few resources among many others available for your use after this presentation concludes. You can see those on the screen. Um, one of those resources is uh, our company website, it's metahvacmetahvac.com. Uh, you'll also see a link here to our quarterly engineer, architect, and facility manager newsletters. In addition, we've also included a link to our case study library where you can explore how BRF is applied in a variety of different applications. And lastly, a link to locate a qualified HVAC contractor or BRF distributor. On behalf of Sam, thank you again for your time and attention today. And with that, I'll turn the presentation back over to our moderator, Ryan to begin our Q&A. Brian? Well, uh, thank you, James and Sam, uh, for a dynamic presentation today, folks. Uh, let me just get my slides up here real fast, and I have just a few uh, housekeeping items to go over before we begin today's Q&A session. Uh, first, your feedback is important to us, uh, so please take a moment to complete the short survey that will pop up after the broadcast is complete. Uh, second, prior to the webinar, we emailed out a link to the PDF of today's presentation. If you did not receive it, you can download a copy 
from the handouts area of the GoToWebinar platform. And uh, third, we're recording this broadcast in full, so if you've missed any part of it or would like to view it again, you may do so via the link that we will email out tomorrow. Uh, as a reminder, if you're watching as a group, please download the group sign-in form, also available in the handouts area, complete it, and send it to learning at forester.net. And uh, finally, we usually receive a lot of follow-up questions on certificates, uh, so if everyone will please take careful note on this. Uh, those of you who have attended the full length of today's webinar will in fact be able to download a certificate with your PDH CEU credits starting tomorrow at noon Pacific time. We do not email everyone their certificate, so obtaining it requires just a few steps on your part. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, simply visit our website, that's foresteruniversity.net, log in your account. This will take you directly to the courses and training tab, and from there you can find today's webinar in the listing and select print certificate. As always, please don't hesitate to send us an email or give us a call if you have any trouble accessing your account or certificate. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and open it on up for questions. I will turn things over uh, to Andy Salaj, who will be assisting me with today's Q&A session by reading the questions for James and Sam. Uh, Andy, whenever you're ready, you have the floor, sir. All right, thank you, Ryan. And thank you, James. Thank you, Sam. We'll get right into it. So, gentlemen, what kind of incentives are utilities offering for VRF? And there's a second part to this question. Um, this person is wondering how those incentives would impact the price of VRF systems compared to alternatives. Um, I, I can tackle the uh, first part of that one, and maybe James can help with the second part. Um, there's a variety of incentives across the country. Um, Usually we have uh, programs that are prescriptive uh, that are based on a, on a per ton uh, type of calculation. Uh, those prescriptives incentives, uh, California's got some with their municipal or public utilities that are pretty generous. Uh, eight or nine years ago, they started out at about 15 or $1,600 a ton, and over time they've kind of ramped down a little bit, but they're still, I think, in the $800 a ton range. Um, and that varies across the country. The Northeast has got a lot of incentives of, as well, but nearly everywhere you go, there's a, an opportunity to do some type of a custom incentive. Um, most utilities will offer that. And then as we move into electrification, um, we're just starting to see the development of those electrification incentives start to shape up now. Yeah, and I, I think if you look at, at incentives as, you know, covering the, the first part or the initial cost of installing a VRF system, I mean, I, I think you can certainly look at it over uh, those costs weighing in and, and recouping some of those initial costs. And then the way to look at a VRF system really is to look at it over the extent of its lifetime. I mean, there have been studies done that, that will show based on maintenance costs, efficiency costs, that over the years, based on what whatever system you want to put it up against, for example, uh, you know, PTACs, which like you see in hotels, which are packaged terminal air conditioners. Um, I mean, there have been studies done that, that'll show that you can realize annual savings in the tens of thousands of dollars that you can basically multiply year over year over year. So I, I think those incentives costs coupled with the, the fact that you have these uh, additional costs or, or lifetime savings really, really add up with a VRF system. All right, great. All right, let, let's this next question isn't really VRF specific, but it does concern the movement towards strategic electrification. Let me just ask it. So in, during the presentation, you mentioned NEEP and their electrification plan in the Northeast. So this person must be in some other area because they're asking what organizations are doing similar work in other regions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so NEEP, again, it's one of the what we call RIOs or Regional Energy Efficiency offices uh, organizations um, in the northwest uh, where i where i live uh, we have nia the northwest energy efficiency alliance uh, sweep in the southwest uh, mia in the midwest so there's they're, they're originally based but outside of that and then we've got groups like the carbon neutral cities alliance um, 
I've been working with the Building Decarbonization Coalition for the last couple of years in California. They're the group that's actually putting together the plan or the pathway of um, how do we accomplish uh, the goals that the state legislatures passed to hit our climate objectives. Um, you know, and then there's various city and state um, organizations that are working on strategic electrification as well and, and coming up with incentive plans and programs. Um, I was, I had mentioned I was in Palo Alto and San Jose last week for electrification events and and then they're part of a, a bigger organization called BayRen or the Bay Area Renewable Energy Network. And, you know, these are organizations that are really coming together on a regional scale to offer and put together energy efficiency programs and provide services and resources um, to help communities that maybe don't have staff uh, to build up that. So uh, I hope I hope that's helpful and maybe answers the question. Okay, great. So we have a, a few um, a few questions related to um, the size of VRS system. So here's a here's a kind of a basic one. Uh, what is the physical size of a VRF outdoor unit? I mean, I, I don't have the exact dimensions in front of me, but uh, again, we have uh, you know sort of the, depending on the the requirements of the building and how large the building is. Uh, I mean, the, the single units are probably no more than three to four feet wide by six feet tall. Uh, and obviously, if you get into larger buildings where you have to combine uh, multiple outdoor units, I mean, that's, that's obviously going to multiply and take up more space. But uh, in, in terms of just a, a single small uh, outdoor VRF unit, it's, like I said, essentially four feet by, by six feet and about probably the same about uh, three feet deep, I would say. Okay, great. All right, so this next question, oh, this is also VRF specific. Um, this person wants to, an explanation of hyperheating and uh, how that would work. Yeah, hyper, hyperheating is, is one component of our systems. We, uh, we have several systems. Uh, we, we, we call it a, a tiered product lineup. We have a a standard efficiency, a high efficiency, and a hyperheating or H2I uh, model. And essentially, it's just uh, uh, an enhanced compressor. It's, it's a, uh, uh, a, a terminology or a way that the compressor actually injects hyperheat uh, or heating into the system to inject refrigerant more, more rapidly into the system to disseminate that more quickly uh, throughout the entire system. And you can find out more about that on the, uh, on the um, uh, Mitsubishi website. Yeah, you know, that's it's become kind of a big deal in the residential side of things too. Um, NEEP has published what's called the cold climate heat pump spec, um, and a lot of the incentive programs, at least on the residential side, are tying their incentives uh, in areas where cold climate heat pumps are are needed. Um, they're tying incentives to that so that somebody doesn't put in a standard heat pump that's not necessarily going to operate at uh, cold climate temperatures or cold amb colder ambient temperatures. So um, the hyperheating units on the residential side have become a pretty big deal um, because a lot of times you don't have an engineer involved. Or it's just a contractor recommendation. So it's one of the ways that, that the utility has been able to ensure that the equipment will operate, keep their customers happy, and provide the savings that they anticipate. Yeah, and as, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, we, we have some of those systems that operate uh, down to minus, minus 31 degrees. Okay, great. Um, this next question, can you talk about microgrids and how they fit into strategic electrification? Um, I, can, I can at least, I don't really work with microgrids, but um, I'm, I think that microgrids are something that are really in the development phase right now, and I know there's communities working on microgrids. Um, I think that it's, uh, I guess, the concept of having, I guess, what I would call uh, energy independence um, is, a, is a big deal, and I know that there's a lot of components that fit into that. Um, you know, you've got solar. I'm, I'm a big advocate, personally, of community-based solar. Um, instead of maybe necessarily individual home rooftop solar. Not that that's a bad idea either, but I think community-based solar is a good idea. 
And I know that fixed into microgrids along with fuel cells and other other really cool technologies. Uh, one of the things that I guess Mitsubishi is doing is uh, we're trying to make sure that our products are demand response ready, both on the commercial side and the residential side with open ADR and uh, use snap adapters and CTA 2045. Uh, some of those technologies because demand response will will play a bigger and bigger role as we roll more into strategic electrification whether it's a microgrid or whether it's for the utility okay great all right let's move on to um, another uh, vrf specific question so uh, this one i think is a callback to um, the slide on uh, on lead uh, the questioner asks how does VRF improve the indoor environment? What about the ventilation component? Yeah, well, I, I think certainly with our VRF systems, uh, you can also partner and use those systems and bring in, uh, you know, dedicated outside air, which we have we have systems that actually uh, filter the air and uh, before it's disseminated to each individual zone. Uh, and that, I mean, addresses some um, ventilation and indoor air quality and improves indoor air quality, uh, as well as helps uh, reduce some humidity, uh, excuse me, humidity. Uh, I, I think when you're looking at systems, I mean, you can certainly compare them and looking at the uh, energy efficient ratings. I mean, we, we, we tend to look at the IEER ratings, uh, as well as the COP, the coefficient of performance ratings. Uh, and I think all of those, if you look at um, all of those, it's a way to way to compare and contrast the units and and speak to more of the uh, the efficiency. Okay, great. Um, this this next question, I think this person must be a, a contractor. Um, they're saying so. The person says we design a number of small hotels, maybe 80 to 130 rooms, which typically utilize PTAC or ETAC units for guest room heating and cooling. And the question is, have you guys seen anyone using VRF for an entire facility? Uh, yeah, cer certainly. We we have a, a very large presence within the, the hotel uh, community. I, I mentioned uh, PTAC systems a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with those, but those are the the units that you might see in hotels uh, that cycle on and off, sometimes in a very very loud manner. Um, I, I think if you look at costs with PTAC systems versus VRF systems, uh, you might have that uh, initial savings up front with PTAC systems. But I think again, if you look at it uh, over time, look at it more from a entire life cycle perspective, um, VRF systems are much more efficient. Uh, they they reduce on maintenance costs. You have very limited maintenance costs when it comes to those. Basically, only needing to change out the filter, uh, clean the coil periodically, uh, and you, you can really realize, uh, you know, depending on the particular application, uh, thousands or multiple thousands of dollars over the course of a single year. So if you multiply that over seven to ten, fifteen years, uh, you're really realizing some significant savings over the lifetime of a BRF system compared to uh, the PTAC system. Well, just the longevity too of the equipment. PTAC's life cycles are much shorter. The VRF systems are going to last, you know, significantly longer period of time and and provide a a lot better customer experience too because of, of noise levels and just room performance. Okay, great. Um, this one is kind of a broader question. Uh, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to electrifying buildings? Uh, I, th I think, I mean, there's <laughs> just working in the last couple of years with the uh, building decarb group in California. That's one of the things that we've been being discussed. Uh, a lot of it is because we think of um, when we think of decarbonization, I mean, we're the main focus is obviously our space and water heating, and so um, some of the some of the disadvantages out there now, frankly, is there's still incentives for uh, putting in high efficiency gas. So, um, you know, the only thing that's going to change that probably is policy. Um, so that's a, a challenge and an obstacle to overcome. Um, and then I think just a, awareness. You know, the the fact that heat pumps will operate in a variety of conditions in cold climates um, and meet the needs of occupants. 
And then um, do they have the ability on the hot water side to produce uh, the amount of hot water that's necessary at, um, for, for large, larger buildings and hotels? Um, one of the things that we've seen is there, uh, we don't have a lot in the US, but uh, one of the products that we're bringing in to be tested is a, a CO2 uh, commercial heat pump water heater, more for like a district level or multifamily housing or bigger office buildings. So some of those things will help overcome some of the, uh, maybe some of the barriers to uh, whether people feel like the technology is there and present and able to accommodate uh, the demand um, in, in those build, those types of buildings. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing Sam mentioned was was policy too. I mean, one, one of the, I'm not sure necessarily obstacles for electrification, but you have, you know, more and more cities, particularly California and New York, I think, that are, um, you know, limiting the expansion of natural gas, for example. So, in some respects, you're 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 forced to look at other opportunities to promote to promote electricity in those scenarios. Yeah, another another big challenge that we're seeing, maybe not as much on the commercial side yet, but on the residential side, as electrification rolls out, there's just a <clears throat> uh, there's a real workforce development challenge that um, we we've got to address. I mean, contractors today are already busy; their <clears throat> their staffs are fully engaged and and frankly, the industry just lacks um, skilled labor and talent to be able to um, do all the work that's going to be coming up uh, in the electrification side of things on the space and water heating. Okay, great. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So we're going to uh, end on a kind of a more general question with regard to VRF. So this person asks, it sounds like the main advantage of VRF is the ability to move heat within the building rather than absorbing heat from or rejecting to the atmosphere. So the outdoor heat pump is only tasked to provide the net heating or cooling. Is this correct? If so, how frequently can the heat pump change between heating and cooling? Uh, I'm, I'm not really certain how, how quickly it can change. The question is how quickly it can change between heating and cooling. I mean, in the, in the scenario that I mentioned earlier with the auditorium, I mean, if you're in a situation where it requires cooling, you can make, make the switch to cooling. If it requires heating, you can, you can flip it to heating. Whereas I, I think with a heat recovery system, it's much more convenient and easy. If, if I'm in a room where I'm, I'm feeling a bit warm, I can lower the temperature and it can, uh, you know, immediately go down. Whereas if I have a coworker in the room that's right next door and they're feeling cool, they can decide to heat that room. So I think one of the advantages, obviously, of of using a heat recovery system uh, is being able to cool one area while simultaneously being able to uh, to heat the room that's just right next door. Okay, great. So um, Ryan, I'm going to pass the the microphone back to you, and uh, you can take us out. Well, thanks, Andy, for uh, helping moderate the uh, Q&A session today. And uh, thanks, folks, for all of your questions and some uh, great answers from uh, James and Sam. Um, of course, lots more in the queue. So if we didn't get a chance to answer your question today, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you via email. Um, on that note, James and Sam, uh, do you have any final comments or advice, kind of some parting words that you might like to leave us with today? No, I mean just just quickly. I wanted to thank everyone for uh, for joining in today. I know this is a very uh, very hot and important uh, subject matter, and we're we're very happy to be able to present uh, some options for being able to help promote strategic electrification. And I hope uh, hope everyone found it helpful. Yeah, likewise, just express appreciation for the interest in the technology and in strategic electrification and kind of what's coming up and uh, anything we can do to help support or answer questions or provide. Uh, any oversight or insight on things, um, feel free to give us a call. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, James, Sam, and the entire METUS staff for today's webinar, and thank you to everyone in the audience for your attendance today. Uh, real quickly, before we uh, let you guys get on out of here, uh, we wanted to make you aware of today's uh, featured product, our Energy Course subscription. Uh, which is great for stocking up on CE credits while expanding your industry knowledge as it enables you to earn 
up to 14 PDH, that's 1.4 CEU for a fraction of the price by giving you instant and exclusive access for an entire year to leading energy experts like James and Sam as they explore the field's most pertinent and pressing topics such as energy master planning, combined heat and power, solar microgrids, human-centric lighting, creating sustainability plans, and smart buildings. Uh, to register for this bundle, as well as to check out our full catalog of more than 300 live and on-demand products, including course subscriptions in additional topic areas, two-for-one specials, series, books and reports, and much more, please visit us at our official online home. That's foresteruniversity.net. And until next time, thank you and have a great rest of your day.